Jackie. Thank you. It's gosh, it's been a little bit challenging trying to we we had a snowstorm and then we had like all kinds of uh -huh. eventualities have led to, to this day, but we're here finally. So yeah. for anybody who doesn't know who you are, what you do, please mm -hmm. introduce yourself. Um, my name is Jackie Terry Carroll. Uh, and I'm one of the founders of the Bring on the Sunshine African Festival that you attended a couple of weeks ago. Which I attended and I had the great honor of being the mm -hmm. MC and host for the day. It yeah. was an incredible event, a truly yeah. incredible event. I was just blown away. Tell anyone who's never been, what is Bring on the Sunshine and how did it come about? It is a, a one day celebration of all good things African. Um, Nine or ten years ago, myself and a number of Zimbabwean families moved to this area, mm -hmm. and you know, you so you're, you're from Zimbabwe. I am from Zimbabwe. Okay. Yeah, um, and we bumped and into yes, each other. I, let, let's just say, <laughs> let, let's just say this: yes, there are white people who are Zimbabweans. For the record, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, but we saw how the kids in our community were just really struggling to find themselves and like how they belonged and you know how they fitted into the community here. And so uh, we actually had some kids who were pretending to be from Jamaica because they didn't know anything good about Africa. It's all like pirates and wars and starvation and you know all the stuff that they show you on TV. And so we thought, you know what? Like we, those of us who grew up there, like were formed and love the experiences and the life that we had um, in Africa. And we have some stories that we could tell them. So we started out initially actually with an Africa camp. Um, it was Zimbabwe camp actually, the first one. Um, and we had people from the community come in and do storytelling and art and music and dancing. And it was just the most incredible day. Uh, we had such a good time and people just felt so good being together. Um, and so we thought, you know what, like Africans are really good at throwing parties. <laughs> so this is something that we can do to give back to Waterloo Region, who's welcomed us like so generously. And uh, at that time, the family day holiday was a new public holiday. And so we said, we're going to throw a party. It's going to be on family day. Maybe a hundred people will show up. But we knew that uh, many of us couldn't travel. Um, and February can get really long. It's a really long season. Yes, <laughs> as we are currently experiencing. As we currently are experiencing. <laughs> yeah, and so it was a way for us to come together and just share that like warmth of community and you know just to feel good. And so we had our first event, and we had 750 people show up on the first what? day. Yeah, it was crazy. So how did let's let's just back up there. How did word get out to 750 people that there was this event? So I just did the things that I know how to do, which is you put stuff up on Facebook. You we we did like the Rogers TV daytime special. We managed to get a couple of radio interviews. We put up posters across town. Uh, we made some really good community connections so um, with the African Canadian Association locally, some of the other country associations, some of the um, local agencies that help people um, settle in KW and somehow we had a party. Wow, yeah. 750. Yeah. Now let's actually just talk about that. So you said, you know, I just mm. did some of the things that I knew how to do. Maybe t back mm. up and tell us what did you do before that gave you those skills? Because I've tried to organize a party before and I didn't have 700 people. <laughs> well, if it's at your house, you typically don't want 700 people coming. Um, but yeah, so I, I grew up in Zimbabwe. My background is arts. Um, and I actually, I went to the University of Cape Town for fine arts. Mm. Um, and I did printmaking, which turned into graphic design. Computers were just coming out then. It was very exciting. So I learned how to uh, do graphic design on computers, which turned into websites, which turned into marketing and communications. And I've always been good at bringing people together around things that I think are important. And not just that I think are important, like things that I can see matter to everybody, right? And that's, I think, is a listening. So listening to what the community wants and what the community needs. And I think we had such an amazing response because there was a whole it, the Bring on the Sunshine was something that had been missing mm. from Kitchener Waterloo region, right? Like people really wanted to come out and um, experience like this whole diverse cultural thing, um, you know, at a time when it was a long weekend and you want to bring your kids to something that's really family friendly mm. um, and something that just feels a little bit different. So, yeah.
And so from there, so you, you host the first event <clears> with <throat> 750 people and did it naturally feel to you like, ah, oh, we need to do this again? Or how did it then become? Because this oh, year was yeah. how many years? Is it the eighth this year? This was, I think, eight or nine. I kind of lose track a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how did, what made you think, oh, let's do this again? And what happened the next year when you did so the event? So that first year, like I, at the time, I was living opposite a church. And I had walked across to them. And I was like, hey, can we do a thing at your place? And they were like, sure. And they gave us the keys, right? And... All these amazing connections just started coming up. Like, oh, I've, I'd love to have a table. I do jewelry. Or, oh, I know these things. And they perform. And they, you know. Um, and then the day before the event, oh, I know someone who's got a band. Can he play? This is the day before the event. <laughs> sure, yeah, come on in, right? Um, and so that was actually how we met um, Tichawana, because he came in with a band, and they were phenomenal. And they were playing like, um, is that that is that a Bob Marley song with da 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 Zimbabwe? Oh yes. The basement was pumping. Like the vibe was yeah. just so fantastic. Yeah. Well, right. Marley came to Zim. Well, I guess he wrote that for yes. Zimbabwean Independence. Yes. Right? Yeah, and he performed it at Zimbabwean Independence. No, I, I actually wasn't there. My husband was, was at he? that concert. Oh, apparently, wow. I I don't know how old he was, but <laughs> <laughs> he says he remembers it. <laughs> yeah. So, like the there were obviously a lot of Zimbabweans involved in launching it because right. we kind of owned it from the beginning but I think like people from diverse backgrounds and people who have felt very at home in Africa um, came to this event and just kind of relaxed and felt like you know they could be who they were and it was just the most incredible vibe and you were like we actually have to do this again because it was just it was so much fun people were so happy we got so much positive um, feedback from everybody who'd attended like it was just electric what do you think it was? What was it that resonated? Because from what I understand, this wasn't just an event for Africans or for no, Zimbabweans. Yeah. This was open to everybody mm. and all different kinds of people came. So what was it that resonated that everybody could kind of come together on? What do you think it was? You know what? Like my experience as a white African moving to Canada is that um, you have to kind of put away the parts of yourselves that don't fit because you have to belong, you have to be able to figure out how to survive and do well in Canadian society. So the more Canadian you are, the easier that is. So there's this whole piece of my life that you sort of put in a box and there's only very specific times when you can pull it out of that box, right? When you're in your cultural environment. Um, and I think Zimbabwe actually has some really unique and very special things about it. Yes, I'm biased, I know. But still, right? Like, w you know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, which in Zimbabwe was in a really incredible time. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of hope and optimism, even though there were some things going on in the background. Um, but we really believed that you, we should just all get along and learn to find out about each other and celebrate like our differences and explore who we were as people. And so we have like a, I think a very interesting dynamic in terms of race relations. And I think we always have on a political level, it's a whole other story. But when you get down to the ground where the people are, like we have something really unique. And so like I was able to bring my sense of being African as a white person and, uh, you know, sort of my friend Alice or some of the other people we connected with come and they were able to be who they were as like black Africans. And we were just really able to relax right and just kind of be all of who you are and for that to be okay right because if i can be african it really kind of expands the territory about what it is to be african and that's so much of what we were trying to do is expand this narrative right because my experience as well like canadians love boxes they love to put you in the box which boxes can you check off you know which box do you best fit into and i don't fit into the boxes i mean i can but I really don't fit well. And I don't think most people fit well into the boxes either. Right. You know, so for instance, um, you know, like I'm an African Canadian and now in Canadian speak, that means black, mm -hmm. but I'm not black, but I am an African Canadian. So what does that mean? How can I live that? How can I ex express that part of myself? Uh, and most often I can't, right? It, it has to go away because I'm a white person. I'm living as a white person in Canada, you know, and I've just kind of, kind of be whatever that calls out of me. But my whole participation in Bring on the Sunshine and all the things that we do, you know, I'm really, I, I love it so much because I feel like I'm able to express such a fuller version of who I am. 
So and that's ultimately what anybody wants to be is right. to express themselves and, and who yeah. they are. And so we've been able to create a space where everybody who comes can do that. Mm. Express the fullest part of who you are and come and enjoy this like amazing vibe that we pull together and you know just be a part of, of who it is that we are together. So. So yeah. describe the day for me, for anybody who wasn't there. Um, I had the great privilege of being there and I had the great privilege too of, of kind of being in, a, in, a, in the perspective of, I could see it from what the audience was seeing, but I could also see the, the <laughs> scramble that's going on in the back and it all came together so yeah. beautifully. So tell me about like, what, what is the day? Like what's your intention each year with, with the Bring on the Sunshine event? We really want to celebrate the best there is of Africa. Um, we all know enough of the bad stuff, and I'm not saying that it isn't there. Mm -hmm. But I always feel like Africa's really got a bad PR problem. You know, because you come to Canada, Canada's got great PR. Canada has problems too, but that's not what you hear about, right? So it's kind of an effort to shift that. Um, and share some of the, the beautiful things, like the people are incredible, the music, the art, like the culture, the stories, like the, the richness of everything that's part of the heritage of Africa and Africans. Like when you grow up in Africa, the past is, it's so much a part of your everyday life. It's so rich and you feel so connected with good or bad, whatever that story of your past is, it's just so present, mm -hmm. you know, in your daily life. And you come to Canada and it just feels like empty. You're like, where's all the, what, where the, what, <laughs> you know, it, it's just like this kind of, it isn't a blank canvas, but that's what it feels like, yeah. you know, when you come. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so to be able to kind of um, tease out much more of those stories, even for those of us from Africa, like we tend to know our own little part of Africa really, really well. But we don't know so much about, you know, sort of North Africa or West Africa or places that are further away. Mm -hmm. So this created an opportunity for us to come together and learn. You know, teach me about Ghana. Teach me about the Azonto dance. You know, teach me about the stories of the people of Somalia. Or, you know, let's explore what that is and really kind of get to grips with who we are as Africans as well. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so interesting because I, I think for, especially in, in North America and perhaps in Europe, we're just this one mass, Africa, right? Mm. And yet we're so diverse. And so that was something that was so interesting to me being at Bring On The Sunshine mm -hmm. was the diversity, the different, mm -hmm. you know, the music, the, the different cultural things that happened. Like, tell me how you go about curating the event because there's such diversity mm -hmm. in terms of the music and the acts and there actually is for one day a lot oh my gosh <laughs> there is actually probably too much <laughs> for the time that we have um i think what we do is we start looking around us like we are a local festival and one of the things that we take quite seriously is our role in elevating the voices of people in our community who are not ordinarily seen um, or heard. People are working double shifts or a night shift or, you know, maybe they don't go to the Blues Festival or the Oktoberfest, which are the really big local events, right? And so people go, oh, well, there's not that many Africans in KW. There actually are. But there isn't a place where they feel comfortable necessarily being a part of, you know, they, they pop up here and there, like we'll have local cultural events, um, like you know, maybe the Nigerian Association will have an event and all the Nigerians go. Uh, we have the KW Multicultural Festival, which is a huge event in the summer. That's one weekend. There isn't a place to really lift these voices in the public sphere. So we are making as many local connections as we can. Who's here? Who does what? Who doesn't have an avenue to express their art or their stories? Or, you know, like their fashion sense. I know when, you know, when, when you grow up in somewhere like Zimbabwe, um, we were surrounded by like smart, educated, talented, ambitious, creative black people. Like that was normal. And when people move here, there's not always a space for them to be that person, even though that's who they were back home. So like if I'm, you know, finding storytellers in the community um, and giving them an opportunity to share this gift like that they have of storytelling, you know, to, to open up like culture to the young people and beyond. Like this is like really, really special. Um, and so we're giving p local people the opportunity to come forward and bring whatever their gift or talent is as much as possible. Um, and then we have a couple of people who might come from out of town. Uh, we actually have people who travel to the festival to attend 
from um, further than Toronto. We've had families who drive from Michigan to come because they're like, there's nothing like this in Michigan and we just want to be here, right? So wow. Wow. that's, yeah, it's quite special. And talking about the community support, something that blew me away was how much support you have at very high levels within the community. The mm -hmm. mayor was there, mm -hmm. the chief of the police department was there. He had all these MPs and dignitaries mm -hmm. who attend. Like, why, why do you think it's important for them to have this festival? And, and even the mm -hmm. fact that it was held at the city that you have this space mm -hmm. within City Hall where they're letting you have it. And, and I, I, I got the chance to briefly chat with the mayor. And he said, you can keep coming back every year. <laughs> You're so excited. <laughs> like, why do you think for them it's so important? Well, I think they really need to have a city that celebrates it di its diversity, like really, you know, because if you want to sell Waterloo Region, um, you need to show that everybody has a place here. Um, so I think it is very important for them to support our event. I know that they, they do value and appreciate us being there. Like the city of Kitchener have been a tremendous support as well. Um, I know that some people really like to have their photo taken at an event like this. You know, fair enough. We all have our social media to curate. That's <laughs> fine. Um, you know, but it's creating opportunities to have conversations with people in the community, um, with people who are in positions of power. So, for instance, the um, police chief, Brian Larkin, They've been very intentional about coming out every year to our event. Um, and they also make sure that they bring out police officers. In some years, they've been able to have a booth as well, who are circulating and enjoying being at the event. So not only are um, our community learning to be at ease uh, with the police forces, the police officers are learning something about our community by being at this event. So it's actually really uh, important, really, really important that they're there. So talking about learning, something else that I had the pleasure of observing was how much you are teaching the youth mm -hmm. and how much youth played a very important role in the organization, even in the running of the festival. Tell me about that and, and why you've structured it that mm -hmm. way. Well, the easy answer is we feel old and tired. <laughs> <laughs> but truthfully, like the whole thing started because of the kids in our community. We started because we saw that our kids didn't know who they were. They didn't know where they were from and they didn't feel proud of themselves or their past. And they didn't feel connected actually to their heritage at all. And we saw that like as a huge loss for them. And so by starting to have these events in whatever form, whether it's Africa Camp or the festival, or you know, we've done spin-off events as well, we're looking for opportunities to share culture so that the kids, and I'm always thinking of my nephew actually, it, I always tell him we started this because of you. <laughs> because I want him to feel proud of who he is. And when he's like with his Canadian friends, um, I want him to feel proud of being African, to be proud of being a young black man. And also to see that, um, the possibilities are endless for him. He could be anything that he wants to in the world. No, I don't want him to see like the barriers and the doors all being closed to him. So by bringing young people into the leadership of the event, we, we're aiming to um, really elevate them in the community, elevate their profile. I want them to meet the mayor and I want you know, them to be hanging out with the MPs and to be able to say that, yes, I can talk to the mayor if I need to, or you know, I know who to go to if I have an, an issue that requires an MP. I want them to feel that confidence um, in um, interacting with people at that level. And I want them to have the skills to be able to, for instance, have an interview, like do a media interview and to feel confident. I want them to understand what it takes to put on a really big event like that. Uh, I want them to ha like have a some kind of idea of what it, the marketing looks like, what the social media looks like, what it looks like to write grants and build budgets and all those kinds of pieces that we learned by doing it that have really um, contributed to our own development, our careers. Um, and ordinarily, young people of color, especially young women of color, would not step up into roles like that and they wouldn't have that opportunity, right? It just... Yeah. It's just kind of the nature of the beast and the system that we live in. Like those are not opportunities that they would step into. But the experience of doing that is incredibly valuable. Whatever direction their career goes, uh, the fact that they can say this, that they've done this on their resume is huge. Uh, we give them fantastic um, uh, letters of recommendation um, when they apply for jobs and so forth. 
And the experience and the understanding that they have of what it takes, it just really, it, it really broadens their horizon and, and it'll add to whatever they decide to do. Let's talk about something that you mentioned right at the very beginning. You talked about Africa Camp and how mm -hmm. all of this really started with this desire mm -hmm. to create a camp for kids. Mm -hmm. So tell me about how that's progressed and, and where, where does that sit now and, and what are you doing with Africa mm -hmm. Camp? So we've had so much interest over the years um, around Africa Camp. And um, I think last year, August, with a one-week day camp, um, we bring in amazing people like you <laughs> who just do have doing cool things in the world right and can come and like inspire the kids just by who they are and how big their dreams are um you know we've had like a black fireman come in we had like a black lady doctor come in and they all thought she was a nurse but she's not she's a doctor right um and that really kind of just helps expand their minds a little bit um, we've had a number of adopted families, so Canadians who've adopted kids from Africa who are looking for ways to connect their kids back into the community who really, really value being part of camp. And we also work with an organization called Adventure for Change who work in the North Waterloo region. Um, and they're working a lot with um, kids who've just got a lot of barriers against them, whether, you know, poverty, newcomers, refugees, just all the layers of stuff. And there are a lot of kids of African heritage who are part of their community. Um, and so in partnership with them, we have been running camp. And last year we had, I think, 60 kids. Yeah, it's crazy. We don't need more kids. <laughs> we really don't need more kids. Um, but we've also been working with them um, to train the youth leaders. So teenagers um, learn how to run the camp. And so we have 30 youth leaders who are of diverse heritage, but it's cool because the kids at camp, the little kids get to see people who look like them in leadership. And so they'll say things like, I want to lead camp one day. And you're like, yes, mm. yes, you do. Right. Which is really it's really exciting to see that because they can kind of envision this future for themselves um, and want to grow into more of that. So, yeah, like at the moment, what we're doing with camp now is actually really just trying to figure out how to be sustainable because we've actually got a really really amazing thing here that we have been running for eight or nine years but it's been love and air <laughs> is how we've been subsisting which is truly phenomenal that yeah. this truly is volunteer driven that yeah. this truly is a from the heart a passion project oh my goodness yeah. is it ever yeah. yeah but like we see the difference that it makes in the kids right because they start to kind of feel like a little more at peace with who they are and they don't feel like quite so always on edge like you see them um just interacting with the groups and stuff and like the the kids who are adopted like they come in and they they're they're not the one who sticks out you know, it's people like me who are the ones who stick out, <laughs> right? And I mean, that's the environment that I grew up in. I think it's so valuable for anybody to experience that. Um, a few years in a row, we actually had Miss Africanada come out from Toronto, and she would interact with the kids. And there was one little adopted girl who just, she just broke my heart. Like, she was exquisitely beautiful, um, you know, but she would come to me, like the white lady, and she'd be like, I wish my skin was like your skin. And she'd stroke my hair, be like, I wish my hair was like your hair. You know, it was just, it was heartbreaking. But Miss Africana came and she had like this gorgeous beauty sash and she had like her, her diamond tiara. And she sat down with this little girl and they were just chatting naturally. I didn't prep her. I didn't tell her go and chat to this little girl, but they were just chatting. And Miss Africa Canada goes, oh, your hair is so beautiful. I love your hair, right? Like those interactions, you cannot put a price on that, right? You, you cannot. cannot put a price on that. And how that changes her mindset and her psyche about yeah. what beauty is to, exactly. to see someone who looks like her and her, has hair like her. And, and I think ultimately with everything that you're doing, I mean, that's in a, in a way we all want to feel that sense of belonging to yeah. see people that we can, you know, resonate with in, yeah, in, in a way. Exactly. And so something really important that you said is really this has been a volunteer driven, donations driven and yet you have a regular life. This is not your full-time job. No. So <laughs> tell me about Jackie outside of Bring on the Sunshine and Africa Camp. Well, um, I work in the not-for-profit sector. I work in fundraising. Um, it's always been important to me to do work that matters. Um, yeah, and I, it's amazing, like a lot of the skills that I really developed through Africa Camp through the festival I've really been able to use um, in my career and my day job as well 
which has been really cool. And that's really what I want the, the kids who are involved to be able to, to benefit from as well. So, yeah, like I, I live in Elmira in Ontario, which is a very, very small town. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm exotic. <laughs> I, am, I am the exotic wife. <laughs> But a question for you, Jackie. Mm. So you you said it, and something it's something you spoke about earlier on in our interview, where you could very easily you're white, you're you know you speak a mm. certain way. So you could have come to Canada and just been assimilated into the white Canadian. You didn't need to make yourself part of this. Like what? Why do you feel? For you, it's so important because this isn't a cause that you're not identifiably a mm. minority. Why is it so important for you? Like, what is your purpose? What do you think is your purpose with all of this work that you're doing? I've always felt like my role in life in general is um, to be a bridge builder. And that was part of my role when I was in, back in Zimbabwe as well, just in the community work and stuff I was involved in. Like, um, I'm the person who can be very comfortable in a room full of black people. Like, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I stick out. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> right? But then I can also be, feel very comfortable um, in a room full of white people as well. And because I'm able to do that, I can open doors to conversations that might not ordinarily have happened. Um, and I think because like my whole, the formation of who I am happened in, in Africa. And I'm just so cognizant of all the, the benefits and the joys and the experiences that I gained. Because honestly, like I had an incredible life in Africa. And sometimes it's hard to be in Canada. There's definitely a trade that we make. But, and, you know, here I am for right now. Um, but it feels like a way that I can contribute. You know, like our country of Zimbabwe is going through a lot of things still. And I am so powerless over so many of those things. This is something I can do, right? This is something I can do. What's your dream for what this will look like in five years from now? I would love to have uh, Bring on the Sunshine like happening in every major city across Canada, actually. I think that would be really cool. We've actually been invited. We have some friends up in Nunavut because Zimbabweans are everywhere. <laughs> They're like, Jackie, we Even have... in Nunavut? <laughs> they are. We actually, we had a friend who left <laughs> to go up there to, for, for a job, but he joined the other and Zimbabwean who was already there. <laughs> and just to put it in context for anybody who does not know where Nunavut is, like, this is, like, we think that here is cold. Like, that's a whole nother level of cold. Like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, they need some sunshine for sure. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I think we have something that's really unique and really special. Um, and I think it's something that we'd really love to share. And let's talk mm -hmm. about the Africa camp and what mm -hmm. your your vision is and your dream and not just the Africa camp. I know mm -hmm. as well that part of what you're doing now is leadership development mm -hmm. for African children. So what's your dream with that aspect? I would love for it to be um, self-sustainable. Uh, and I would actually like to not be in the picture because I don't think my face needs to be there, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's quite a politically charged situation, I find. Um, so it, it's not like, you know, green technology or something. That's like, oh, everybody's like, yes, let's do green technology. You know, when you're looking at like developing self-esteem and, and leadership in kids of African heritage, it's kind of like, oh yes, someone, someone should do that. But it's not necessarily something that people own as a community. Like one of the, um, the values that we hold at Bring on the Sunshine, and, and you would understand this as well, is that the, um, around the word Ubuntu, like we're all connected, we're all in this together. You know, and although like our focus is on kids of African heritage at Africa Camp, we have Syrian kids in there. We have Latino kids who come. We have just regular old Canadian kids who come to Africa camp and they have a ball. They have so much fun and they see kids of color in leadership positions. They see the black fireman and the black lady doctor and their whole world is shifted because of stuff that they're learning as well. And I find that just incredible because that's kind of the vision of the world that we want to live in, right? So we know that there are certain cultures that have a lot of prejudice against other cultures. And typically it would be your Arab cultures and your Latin countries as well. But their kids are at Africa camp. 
their kids are learning like how cool African culture is and they're learning to look up to African people in leadership positions and I'm like that's where the world is going or that's the world that I want to see so uh, we could talk forever. <laughs> and I'm what I want to say to you is thank you because not everybody who has an idea does anything with that and so the fact that you had an idea and then you've continued to grow this idea now it's become this thing that you know you gathered thousands of people in a weekend and I just want to I want to acknowledge you for that and say thank you thank you thank so you. much for mm -hmm. what you're doing because what you're doing will you know it it it, it truly impacts lives in a true sense because those kids see themselves and see different possibilities mm -hmm. for themselves so mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that and I want to ask you one last question so this platform is called Ndini mm -hmm. which in my mother tongue you know my mother tongue because you go from <laughs> yeah, <pretty old> <laughs> Um, means I am and it's mm -hmm. because I believe that whatever you say after I am really shapes your life your mm -hmm. destiny and your possibilities so mm -hmm. finish that sentence for me mm -hmm. I am possibility what's your biggest dream for yourself Wow <laughs> um, you know it's I really do want to change the world it sounds ridiculous, but I really do. Because I really think there are some things that could be shifted for the better, really. And I want to find out what those levers are so I can shift the world. And I would be remiss to end this interview without mentioning your amazing husband. Can we just talk <laughs> about him and, and his role and what he does in supporting you and the work that you mm -hmm. do? Because I know he does a phenomenal job. He does, yeah. So my Canadian husband, DJ, um, is a drama teacher and a festival buff. He loves events. And he is a huge piece of Bring On The Sunshine. He's our site director and does all kinds of things behind the scene. Um, he actually brings in a cohort of Elmira kids. Remember Elmira, a really, really small town, rural Canada? So he brings like 20 or 30 of these kids down to Bring On The Sunshine and they help in various roles. They dress up in animal costumes and play with the kids all day. And just, they basically just add a lot to the event. And um, yeah, he actually is, he was quite keen to be part of this interview. I told him he couldn't. No. He should be. We'll have him down. Well, he's, uh, yeah, he's been preparing. We've been married for three years right now, and he's been preparing his script for, um, he's, a, he's a wannabe comedian. And he wants to, <laughs> he has a, a, a thing that he wants to do on what it is to be married to an African woman. <laughs> We'd love to have that. We'd love to have that. We, we, we'll let him out. He's, he's upstairs in timeout right yeah. now. We'll bring him down. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, so mm -hmm. just how supportive he is, because that's the other yeah. thing that I got to mm -hmm. experience here, is seeing him bring his crew of kids, mm -hmm. direct them. The, he does a magic show. Mm -hmm. Just it, it was truly phenomenal to, mm -hmm. to watch just how invested he was in this event. Yeah, I think for him, like, he learns about me when he's involved. He learns about who I am and what shaped me and where I'm from um, by being involved in this event. So, yeah, and he, he does. He brings a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank You're you. phenomenal. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.